Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave for part three of our Amiga 1000 Trash to Treasure series. The series in which we restore what started out looking like a box of yellow junk into that classic computer, the Amiga 1000. Such an important computer in my own personal computing history and I know for many of you viewers, I know you're big Amiga fans out there. Which is why it's quite difficult to take the rose tinted spectacles off in this series and through the medium of Byte magazine, learn about the history of the machine as it was reported at the time, whether that be the initial excitement and enthusiasm of the announcement of this machine to that enthusiasm waning as things developed. And we're gonna learn a bit more about that today as we go into the years 1986 and 1987. The machine was launched in 1985 and we're gonna carry on learning about that through Byte Magazine. But we're also gonna conclude our restoration. If you've not seen the first two episodes, there are links in the video description to go back and watch them now in which we learned about the launch, the competition, and the distribution shortcomings that were hitting Commodore and holding back the product perhaps. But was it a success in the end? We're gonna find out today, but not before we've made a good start and inroads into that restoration. So let's get stuck into something I've been putting off for a while because it's so damn disgusting. It's that keyboard. We're gonna need the gloves on for this. This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com, purveyors of quality joysticks for all of your retro kit, joysticks, adapters, arcade control parts, and more. Check them out at MonsterJoysticks.com, and we thank them for supporting the cave. Blah. Having dealt with the case in episode two, I can ignore the keyboard no longer. And if I did, it would probably grow legs and walk itself out of here. We need to deal with both the filth and the yellowing, and that is a really yellow keyboard. The underside of the keyboard gives us an idea of the color that it actually should be. And of course, there's more dirt. There's always more dirt. What did I expect? We'll strip it down for cleaning. And you'll notice as we do, we only have two of the original four screws. And I suspect that's because of damage to the screw posts on the inside, because at this age they get extremely brittle and it doesn't take much for them to get broken. And sure enough, as we take the lid off, there is a shattered screw post there. Let's now remove all of the keycaps. There's nothing special or tricky about removing these. You can manage it with your fingers, but if you have a keycap puller, it makes your life easier. Let's get you in nice and close now so that you can see the full extent of that horror. Ugh. As we often see with keyboards that we restore on this channel, the keys look like they'll clean up just fine to their original colour, but the space bar is a completely different colour. That's yellowed in line with the case and how that's yellowed, probably due to a different manufacturing process to the keycaps. So the space bar and the case will retro bright but the other keys hopefully we can just clean. On this particular day in the UK, we were in the midst of a heat wave with temperatures outside the cave topping 40 degrees C, that's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Thankfully, the cave is air conditioned and on balance, I considered the car journey to keep cool in the cave with me instead of overheating at home was the lesser of two evils for my cat Gizmo. So she's hanging out with me today, overseeing the operation. keycaps and the case gets a good scrub in some soapy water so I clean them up in there with some car shampoo and then I rinse them in a bowl of clean water just to make sure all of the soapy suds are gone and then set them aside to dry and as I'd hoped the keys have cleaned up brilliantly they don't need any more work whatsoever they just needed a good scrub despite those temperatures outside I wanted to make sure that the retro brighting process was low and slow for this effort it's probably the yellowest thing I've ever had to restore to date, and I just wanted to be super careful with it. I've also never retrobrighted in 40 degree heat, so I don't really want the Amiga 1000 to be the first machine that I try that in. It may be fine, but I just don't want to take that risk, so indoor retrobrighting it is. At least until things calm down outside. I'm British, remember, complaining about the weather not being right, whether it's too sunny or too cold, it's what we do. We'll pour in some liquid hydrogen peroxide, that's 12% strength. So this is a heated plant propagation box. The base will warm up when it's plugged in. 
and I'm hanging a full spectrum light above it. I'm wrapping it in some foil just to help the heat stay in there more efficiently. Once that was up and running, I popped a probe in to check the temperature and it was a consistent 32 degrees C or 89 degrees Fahrenheit and I was happy with that. This method is slower than doing it outside. Of course, you can't beat the power of the sun and it took around 24 hours in total on and off. But given the conditions are consistent, I can just replace the liquid every six hours or so. It's pretty low effort, replace the liquid, leave it going. I think using this method outside in 30 degrees C sun is probably my favorite way of retro brighting at the moment. While that's baking away, I just wanted to take care of a little bit of surface rust that's on the keyboard. So I gave it a good clean, of course, it was as filthy as every other part of this thing. And then I carefully applied some rust remover and just let that fizz away before cleaning it off again. Being really careful not to get any of it into the key switches because that won't do those any good at all. I did give this one more pass after filming this bit just to get rid of the last little bits of rust, but you can already see that most of it is given away to just showing the silver that's coming through where the black paint would have been. We've stripped the paint, of course, in the process. It's a bit messy, but it's a hell of a lot better than having rust all over the keyboard. And, and it's a small thing, but it gives me peace of mind. Let's get the keycaps back on now. And then once that retro brighting is finished, we can see it all come together. But we'll go back to our history lesson before we complete that. Let's take our history now from the launch in 1985 and we're moving into 1986 now where Commodore have really got two key jobs on their hands. Number one is to prove to the world what the Commodore Amiga is for. Why would you specifically pick the Amiga over any other computer out there? What can you do that's unique on that machine? The other thing is to just get the thing into dealers' hands. If people can't buy it, a user base won't form without the user base. The software houses won't see that as an attractive market to create software for and the whole house of cards will fall down. We're not off to a great start. In April 1986's Byte magazine, we hear of the Comdex, or Computer Dealers Exhibition, the big trade show that's held in Las Vegas in this period. The magazine says, the Commodore folk were not at Comdex. They would reserved the space, but they didn't use it. Instead, they held a press conference. The official line was that Commodore is selling all the Amiga computers it can make, and thus has all the dealers it needs. It would be silly to spend all that money just to tell potential dealers they can't come aboard. A likely story, Commodore, and I don't think many people would have actually been buying that story or the Amiga itself if it's not getting into dealers' hands. It continues, Atari's comment on that was, we sell more Atari 520 SDs than Commodore sells Amigas, and we sure want to sign up more dealers. The rumor in the press room was that Commodore bankers were signing its checks and wouldn't advance the money to pay for Comdex. They conclude with, I wouldn't know. What I do know is that Commodore Amiga is one hell of an exciting machine. So at least in this column of Byte Magazine, the enthusiasm hasn't waned for the Commodore Amiga. However, there's a difference between exclusivity and elusivity. It's one thing to be exclusive. It's another thing to not be able to find the machine at your local dealers. Sales are still very much needed. And you don't have to look far in the magazine to find someone less enthusiastic though. It's our old friend, the Webster column in June 1986, a column that was initially very excited for the Amiga, but now is very clearly frustrated with Commodore. It reads, the bankers are apparently convinced that a live but ailing Commodore stands a better chance of paying off its debts than a dead one. And that sales of the C64, C128 and Amiga are sufficient to keep Commodore alive for now. Smart folks, those bankers. The two big problems still appear to be the lack of software and Commodore itself. Commodore seems to be hurting its own cause by throwing up roadblocks for developers. The latest obstacle, Commodore apparently wants software firms to pay $500 per product per year for the privilege of putting the Workbench desktop interface on their product disks. Workbench, remember, is something that every Amiga owner will already have as it comes with the Amiga. It seems short-sighted because it is. There were also reports of staff being laid off at Commodore, including the Amiga's vice president for software. Jay Miner was asked by Byte to confirm this, and he told the magazine that some Amiga software people had gone. He wasn't any more specific than that. 
Software then continues to be a problem for the Amiga and in making the Amiga attractive. They really need those third-party developers on board. And to do that, they probably need some good software people in-house to um, support those third-party developers, to encourage them to make them feel comfortable in developing for the platform and give them all the tools that they need in order to do that. They don't need to be telling them they need to pay $500 a year per product to use Workbench, which everybody already has on a disk anyway, because it comes with the Amiga. That's just crazy. So things are starting to look a little bit desperate. And it's probably only because of sales of the Commodore 64 that are continuing that Commodore continue to be propped up. There's no way in my mind that this company could have survived on Amiga 1000 sales alone. It's not looking good, but thankfully things take something of a turn in the middle of 1986. Here's a face that any Amigan will be familiar with. It's the mask of King Tutankhamun created in the art package Deluxe Paint. Was this the Amiga's killer app? Well, we can continue our story from this point shortly, but let's check again on our restoration progress. What has become of our yellow keyboard then? Did Gizmo get the job done? Well, that spacebar there has come up beautifully. The shade is now indiscernible from all the other keys on the keyboard. And look at that, the case has also returned to its original color. There's no marbling, there's no uneven shades over it. It's like a brand new keyboard. And if you think it might be, go back in this video and look for this little crack. It's there earlier. It's where somebody put a screw in that's too long and it's just cracked the surface of it. And there's your proof that it's the very same keyboard and I'm not pulling a fast one here. There's still one job to do here though and that's to remove the protective film from the Amiga TIC logo. That's as good as we could possibly have hoped for, given its condition. And I also had some extra time, so I put the case itself through the indoor retro brighting process just one more time to top it up to see if we could bring it up one more shade from what we did in episode two. Why not? It was all set up and ready to go. And then all that remained was to put the thing back together. The shielding went back on it and the case all screwed back together. Observant viewers in episode two may have spotted that I did have an Amiga monitor briefly, but sadly that was on loan and had to go back to the owner. So I've settled for this slightly later Philips monitor to sit on here. And there's your first sight of the fully restored Amiga 1000. This is one of the most satisfying parts of what I do to take a mess and from it share with you the experience of restoring and seeing it as it would have looked new or as close to as new as we can manage and just to try and capture that moment in time of the new system. We've taken a biohazard, cleaned it inside and out using the tools available to us in the cave. We've recapped, we've retro brighted and we've restored and shortly I can pull up a chair and I can use this thing as well as throw in a few upgrades in. Now, where were we with that history lesson? Back now to Deluxe Paint. It was created by Dan Silver. It was published by Electronic Arts and initially it was exclusive to the Amiga and it became something of a standard in creating what we now call pixel graphics, what we would have just called graphics back then, and um, quite a standard package that artists really like to use. Now it did become available for the PC, for the Apple II GS, for the Atari ST in later years, but from 1985 to 1987, this was an Amiga software product. Was this the Amiga's killer app? Well, that depends how much you need an art package. It's debatable, of course, but more importantly, this was a marketing department's dream. The visual capabilities of the Amiga could be promoted in a single striking image using that King Tutankhamun demonstration picture. That picture was dynamite. By August of 1986, having failed to turn up with a stand at Comdex, Commodore now failed to show up at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, just another show that you would fully expect a company like Commodore to be at, especially when they have product to promote. So it wasn't looking good on that front, but from a consumer point of view, prices were coming down and that gap between the Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga were now starting to close. 
So the Amiga is moving into more affordable territory, but it still has a way to go before it's in the same price bracket as the Atari ST. Let's read some more from August 86. Management changes are also encouraging. These include shifts in location, back to the west coast, and changes in the people who handle third-party developers. Ever since Commodore moved third-party relations last year to Westchester, Pennsylvania, developers have been complaining about a lack of cooperation from the company. So it seems Commodore are now finally starting to recognize the problems and the roadblocks that are holding back developers and trying to address that. It goes on to read, there is universal agreement that Commodore has finally committed itself to the Amiga and is heading in the right direction. The frustration is more in terms of lost time and opportunity and about time too. However, things move very quickly in technology and our 1985 machine is now moving into 1987 and we see the first signs in the Webster column of Byte magazine of the Amiga 1000 actually being superseded with a new model. The Amiga 1000 will be phased out and replaced by at least two systems. One is described as a low-end version of the 1000 with limited expandability. The price given is $649. Lining this, the Amiga 500, up to be a direct competitor to the Atari ST. We'd soon find out more in March 1987 when the Amiga 2000 is revealed. The 2000 is a system that builds on the original's custom chipset with a host of internal expansion options. It has a dedicated CPU and video slot and many more features besides. There's talk of powerful CPU upgrades and maths coprocessors to make the machine a real powerhouse. The last site of the Amiga 1000 for sale in Byte magazine comes around quickly in July 1987, where it's listed alongside the unpriced Amiga 2000 and 500. The Amiga 1000 package, including the monitor, is now priced at $1,099, and a very reasonable price that is too, in my opinion. In a little over two years since its launch, the Amiga 1000 seems to be drawing to a close of its life, or at least in dealers, because with a bit of RAM here and an upgrade there, the Amiga 1000 had plenty of life left in it for owners who could still enjoy the software that would come out for those two new systems, the 500 and the 2000. And I think it was a really sensible move actually to split that out, the low cost version to tackle the Atari ST, the higher end version to introduce internal expansion, which is severely lacking. Well, it's not really there at all in the Amiga 1000 unless you start hacking things into the CPU slot. Um, and if you consider that front uh, RAM module in internal expansion, I guess it is, it has a cover on it. But other than that, everything has to come out of the side. There's lots more to think about in terms of the legacy of the Amiga 1000, so let's gather our thoughts and we will talk about that in a moment. But let's now finish up that restoration so that we can see our own Amiga 1000 in all its glory. Let's talk upgrades now. Yes, there are lots of options, new and old for the machine, but this is one machine that I really want to keep close to stock. It just feels wrong to go crazy on it. So I've chosen some simple quality of life upgrades. To increase the memory, I had two options. This two meg Compspec branded module is an option that was loaned to me and you can see it's got a pass through connector to chain together multiple add-ons through it on the side. So let's put this to the test, shall we? This is another two megs of RAM in the form of a Cortex branded expansion. This is mine, this one. So let's combine them and see if it works. It's amazing how quickly the lovely Amiga case loses all of its elegance when you start expanding out the side of it. And there we go. Four megs of RAM detected on our side modules. We've got 256K on board, 256K on the front slot, and that gives us four and a half megs in total. What to do with all that memory? As I said, the Comspec module isn't mine, so we'll stick with two and a half megs using my Cortex module. And for ease of life, I'm installing what's called a soft floppy switch. This is a board that the CIA chip will piggyback on, and it will allow me to set an external floppy drive as the primary drive. So it looks for that first, and we don't have any compatibility problems or issues. And indeed, we can just boot from a USB stick to get that kickstart into the system as we need to when you first turn it on. There's no hardware switch for this, that's the beauty of it. You simply hold control and the two Amiga keys for four seconds and then it switches to the external drive. It's a really neat solution. And I'll put a link to it in the video description. 
I've done this so that I can use the GoTech floppy drive emulator in an external housing and that lets me select those disk images on the little screen and load them up just like real floppies. So we've gone for RAM, easy to use floppies and that's all I want honestly. I want a 1985 experience with a little bit of convenience peppered on top. I'm happy with that. And something else I had to try. Remember how Amiga started out making game controllers for the Atari 2600? Well, of course they work for the Amiga too. It's an awful, awful joystick, but I gave it a go and uh, I enjoyed seeing the games, if not you playing them with this joystick, but I enjoyed revisiting some of the classics and some of my favorites. Games like Terrican 2 and Lotus Turbo Challenge 2. And then I had a little go on Deluxe Paint. So what of the legacy of the Amiga 1000? Any other system that we talk about that's had a lifetime in the dealers of about two years, just over two years, is usually considered to be an abject failure. And you could, by most metrics, consider the Amiga 1000 to fall into that category but it does have an important legacy. Yes, there were changes and tweaks made to create the Amiga 500 and the 2000, but the custom chipset that the Amiga team poured their hearts and souls into when creating the original Amiga 1000 was still the driving force in these new machines. A clear commitment from Commodore into the platform with these new machines would have given developers more confidence to commit to it themselves, and with the low-cost A500 model, new markets would open up such as gaming, which would become such a driving force for the system in Europe. Software that was created during the 1000's life cycle, such as Deluxe Paint, was impactful and desirable on the page, but out of touch for many of us because of the price of the system. But now the low-cost Amiga 500 had come along, well, pretty much everyone who had a 500 had a copy of Deluxe Paint, legit or not, and was scribbling and using the flood fill tool all over that King Tut face. So let's return to the original question that we started this series with. Based on the evidence of the magazines that we've been reading over these three episodes, would I get my wallet out and part with my hard-earned cash to have bought an Amiga 1000? Well, no. As desirable as it is as a retro collector, I don't think, based on the evidence we've seen, I would have bought one. I don't know what I would have gone with instead, but if I'd still not made up my mind at this point, I absolutely definitely would have picked up the phone in response to this advert and said, tell me what the price is for an Amiga 500, because that's exactly what I did. I went to Lansdowne Computer Center in Bournemouth on the south coast of the UK, picked up an Amiga 500. I think it was about 399 pounds in 1989. Um, it was before the Batman pack or any of that came out and um, picked up this Amiga 500 with a few games thrown in, Eliminator, Power Play. Um, there was an office package that was thrown in with it. So we kind of created our own package through haggling <laughs> with the dealer. There were no distribution problems. There were plenty of shops we could have gone to. The Amiga 500 was available wherever we wanted to pick one up. And that's exactly what we did. And that's how I got onto the uh, Amiga platform in the first place. There's one more question I'd like to ask though about the Amiga 1000. Um, we saw the launch event, we saw the mistakes that Commodore made in the opinions of the developers and the people that were there, like Dr. King, and we learned that perhaps the audience didn't even know that the Amiga was putting out those images. We had the Boing Ball demonstration, we had um, the, the artist Andy Warhol there using Pro Paint to, to draw an image of Debbie Harry. What if you could go back in time and deliver a set of discs to that launch event from a time when people had finally mastered programming and getting the most out of this multimedia machine. And what if the lights dimmed, the curtains drew back, the Amiga 1000 was there center stage, and this came out of it? Could that have made history a little bit more different? I'll leave you to decide. Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching and take care. Bye-bye. Good evening. What you are about to witness is the result of an effort of research and engineering that began in 1982 
the Amiga computer. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official Cave Dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro. 